This series is not a game changer. That's not the words that I believe appropriately describes what God is going to do with this series. This series is not a game changer, but rather it is a life changer. This series has been constructed and designed by the Holy Spirit to get us to see results. This is why for part one of this planted series, for part one, I was trying to tell us, okay, everybody who's saying that 2023 is going to be the year you win. Everybody who's running around saying God's going to do this this year and I'm going to do that this year. You're actually setting yourself up for disappointment on December the 31st of 2023. If you're saying God's going to do this, but your routines don't change. Because hear me, church family, it's not that God is not hearing our prayers. It's just that talk can't override traits. Did y'all hear what I just said? Talk can't override traits. You can talk all you want to about what God is going to do. But if your traits of petty haven't changed, if your traits of rebellion haven't changed, if your traits of disobedience haven't changed, if your traits of sleeping with somebody that you're not married to, uh uh-oh, hasn't changed, you have a lot of talk, but you don't have the traits. And frustration is imminent. When you keep on getting no results and the child lack is the child of uncertainty. When I keep on lacking results, uncertainty rises. When I keep on lacking a return on my investment, uncertainty rises. And I'm trying to help us to become a people who stop saying, nah, I'm good, but suffer in silence. Enough with that. I'm good. No, you're not. How about be honest and say, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated that I do not see the fruit from my labor. I'm frustrated. I'm still grieving over the life I thought I would have by now. Because like I told us, your new life is always going to come at the expense of your old one. And if we be honest, all of us have experienced a time in our life, if you haven't, keep on walking with Jesus, there is going to be a time where you thought that this would happen by now, but it didn't. And do you still know how to trust him when he seems to be delayed? It's okay to acknowledge that. The problem is staying in that. Staying in that particular place. And my assignment, the Holy Commission with this particular sermon series is to get us to become believers, to get us to become Christ followers, to get us to become world changers, to get us to become ambassadors who are fruitful. Somebody shout fruit. But that's only going to happen if you are planted. And the reason I've been preaching so passionately, the reason I've been sweating out my clothes each and every week, And the reason that some of us have possibly already experienced opposition this year, the reason that some of us have already experienced assault and attacks is because the enemy knows if they ever can become planted. I feel like preaching this afternoon. If they ever can become people who are planted. If they ever can become people who have made a resolve to remain, even after the desire to remain has left. If they can ever become people who have discovered that the power of the problem is in the routine. If they could ever become people who recognize the benefit of being planted is that you will experience fruit in your season. If they could ever become planted, chains are going to break. If they could ever become planted, strongholds will be be demolished. If they could ever become planted, they will shift the trajectory of their bloodline. If they could ever become planted, their marriage will improve. If they could ever become planted, their singleness will improve. If they could ever become planted, they'll grow in Christ. If they could ever become planted, they will be like a tree by the streams of living water. Who yields its fruit and its season and your leaf will not wither if we could ever become planted. But there is this bacteria. 
this bacteria that has infected and affected our ability to be planted. And we're going to spend the rest of our time this afternoon talking about that bacteria that's getting in the way of us being planted. Our foundational text, John chapter 21. I want us to see this. I'm going to have to explain it first. John chapter 21. We're going to launch our reading at verse 18. In just a moment, I want to give you a little backdrop. Peter and Jesus are having this conversation. Peter and Jesus are conversing, and Peter's like, Lord, I'm willing to die for you. We live together. We die together. Disciples for life. <laughs> I'm going to go all the way. And Peter says, <laughs> bro, before the rooster crows, three times, before the rooster crows on tonight, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, never. I'm about that life. So after the Last Supper, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Judas comes, and he betrays Jesus with a kiss. Sidebar, every kiss is not a sign of endearment. Sometimes it's a sign of betrayal. So he, he kisses, somebody caught that. He kisses Jesus, and Jesus tells Judas, friend, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss. Now remember, Peter's about that life. So he took out his sword and he chopped off the high priest servant's ear. And Jesus is like, okay, bag, bag. Go ahead and put your, your strap up. Don't you know that I can call on my father right now? And he will send me more than 12 legions of angels. But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled? And Jesus does his last earthly miracle. Before his crucifixion and resurrection, he takes this man's bloody ear, puts it back on this man's head, so that if they tried to convict Peter of assaulting an officer, they couldn't do it because Jesus erased the evidence. That's a whole other sermon. So they arrest Jesus, they're beating Jesus, kicking Jesus. Now Peter sees all of this. He sees this mob Beating Jesus up. He's warming himself by the fire. Read your Bible. I'm just giving it to you fast track. And they're like, yo, you one of them. He's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know who, who Jesus is. Because as he's looking, they're spitting on Jesus. They blindfolded Jesus, punched him in the face and said, prophesy, who hit you? They're mocking Jesus. Peter sees all of that. And they're like, yo, you... Hey, he's one of them. His accent is giving it away. And it's like, no, I don't know who he is. And so they keep on saying, we know that you're a Christian. Can anybody tell that you're a Christian without you saying something? Can anybody tell that you've been with the king because of your kingdom accent? They were like, we know that you're with him. Your accent gives it away. And so Peter had to let him know, okay, let me go ahead and let y'all know I'm not a Christian. I don't bleep and know him. So y'all stop bleeping messing with me. Read the Bible and start cursing. I don't bleep and know him. And if y'all bleep, keep coming at me. I'm a bleep bleep y'all too. So y'all bleep, I don't know him. It's the Bible. And then the rooster crows remind him he's a chicken. <laughs> The rooster crows, rooster crows, feels horrible. He runs off. Jesus' trial is at night. They'll let you know it's sketchy. They're beating him. They flog him. They nail him to a cross. And as I was studying the crucifixion years ago, I used to wonder, God, why, why did Jesus have to hang so long? I mean, he hung there for hours, having to push himself up to breathe. This is why the Roman soldiers would break their legs so that you would suffocate. And you couldn't push yourself up. But for hours, our master is just sitting there causing himself to breathe. I'm like, why did Jesus have to hang so long? And I, be I believe God gave me the revelation. It's because I want you to know I love you even when you feel like I left you hanging. <laughs> Jesus, this is so good, y'all. I haven't even read the text yet. Jesus dies. The third day, he gets up with all power. In his hand. And actually, believe it or not, the first preachers of the gospel were women. <laughs> For everybody who has a problem with women preachers, truthfully, 
the first carriers of the gospel. Y'all don't believe me. Let me show you just so y'all can see this. Just a side note. Luke chapter 24, verse 8. It says, and they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of Jesus, and the other women with them. Women, no men. Women who told these things to the men. It's Bible. First carriers of the gospel were actually women. So then, after Jesus raised from the grave, he shows himself to his disciples. He has this conversation again with Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. He says, Peter, Simon Barjona, do you love me? He says, Lord, you, you know I love you. Jesus tells him, feed my sheep. Says, Peter, this is the third time. I'm like, all these threes. There were three people on Calvary Hill. Peter denied him three times. Jesus was in the grave for three days. And Jesus is restoring him three times. He asked him the third time, do you love me? Jesus asked him this, and Peter starts to feel some type of way. Probably because he's like, oh, Lord, you know all things. <laughs> feed my sheep. And after he says this to Peter, this is where we're jumping in on, on this conversation. John chapter 21, verse 18. This is Jesus speaking to Peter. He says, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself. Certain translations say dressed. You girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you or gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. Because Peter was crucified as well, but he was crucified upside down because he said, I wasn't worthy enough to be killed like the Lord. So a whole other level of Christianity. We get offended because we have to scoot anyway. So after he says this, signifying by what death he would glorify God, when he spoke these things, he said to him, follow me. When Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Our verses of emphasis, our clause of concern that's going to be our waiter to give us some spiritual insight for the rest of our shamanic journey on this afternoon are these eight profound words. Eight profound words that Jesus tells Peter in John chapter 21, verse 22. These eight words, he tells Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, you know what Jesus was telling Peter? That's none of your business. That's none of your business. Mind your business. You know what your business is, Peter? Follow me. Don't worry and focus on John. You follow me. Drive it home, Jerry. Don't worry about what they're saying. Follow me. Don't worry about what they're saying on the news. Follow me. Don't worry about what people think about you because it is not your responsibility to try to change the version that somebody has of you in their head. That's exhausting. Let them think what they want to think. You know what you need to do? You follow me. You follow me. You follow me. When it's hard, you follow me. When it gets difficult, you follow me. When you don't like it, you follow me. When it's uncomfortable, you follow me. Bad breakup, you follow me. Layoff, you follow me. Negative doctor's report, you follow me. Stop worrying about them. It says, mind your business. And many of us are like, okay, but God, I want a ministry like brother and sister so-and-so. And God, I want an opportunity and a platform like brother and sister so-and-so. But here's my question. What do you do if God wants to give you a 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 type of ministry? Put this on the screen where we can see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9, it says, what no eye has seen, 
what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. What if I told you, you praying, God, I want a ministry like that as you actually settling. I'm going to do something in your life. I feel this. I'm going to do something in your life. Eyes haven't seen it. I'm going to do something in your singleness. Ears haven't heard it. I'm going to do something in your ministry, Jerry. Minds can't even conceive it. I'm going to do something in your life and something in your city that you are going to be a pioneer. So the question is, do you trust me enough to anoint you as my blueprint? Do you trust me enough to anoint you as my example? Do you trust me enough to anoint you as the one I will use? I want it like them, but what if I want to do something that's never been seen before? <laughs> Actually, we could be settling. I want to anoint you to be my trailblazer. So for you to do that, you're going to have to stop letting the comments of those who only follow trails affect your blaze. You're called to be a trailblazer. Preach Holy Spirit. I'm doing something new in your life. Peter says... But what, what about John? <laughs> what, what about John? I'm going to follow you, but what about John? I want y'all to help me preach this, okay? When I point at you, I want you to shout as loud as you can, you follow me, all right? Y'all don't have the right to remain silent. I want you to preach this as a declaration over your life and to intimidate hell. When I point at you, you shout, you follow me, all right? Going through a pandemic. You follow me. Hard circumstance. You follow me. Negative doctor's report. You follow me. Not enough views yet. You follow me. I don't know how I'm going to do it. You follow me. That breakup hurts. You follow me. Ministry not growing yet. You follow me. Mama's toxic. You follow me. Family's toxic. You follow me. Pastor's toxic. You follow me. Regardless what you face, y'all say it. You follow me. You follow me. 